piece of the puzzle. Uh, this is the age-related cholinergic activity during nicotine exposure and withdrawal. We know that smoking incident has decreased over the last years among the general population. However, uh, this problem is, is a major health problem among adolescents. Adolescents are particularly vulnerable to tobacco abuse, and they are more likely to initiate tobacco use and continue to use tobacco products as, ad as adults. As a result, they are at great risk of smoking-related disease caused for long-term tobacco use. It's not the same to start smoking at 16 or start smoking at 20 or 30. So, so the long-term tobacco use is a, it's a cumulative, it's a deleterious. Studies have demonstrated that adolescent rodents display fewer physical symptoms of nicotine withdrawal compared with adult rats or mice. Also, the rewarding effects of nicotine are enhanced during the adolescent period of development. If you put all these two, these two characteristics together, it's a, it's a dangerous combination. They feel better when they're, they're receiving nicotine, and they don't feel so bad when, I, when they are during withdrawal as compared as, uh, with adults. It is well accepted that relapse to smoking behavior is due in large part to negative reinforcement processes that maintain smoking behavior and relapse in order to avoid the negative consequence of withdrawal. Nicotine in this uh, sense is the same that all other drugs of abuse. The individual starts using it, looking for the positive uh, rewarding effects, and they don't, they don't want to stop in order to avoid the negative consequence of withdrawal. Current pharmacological treatment strategies focus on alleviating withdrawal. However, the role of withdrawal in smoking behavior during adolescence is, is not very clear. So we're going to focus on that part. What we know, we know that there are more 4,000 chemicals found in smoke. Uh, we're going to focus on nicotine because it's the, the primary reinforcing component of tobacco. Maybe I had to update my slide later and put a menthol here instead of methanol. It seems like it's important. Also, what we know, we know that uh, the mesolimbic system or brain reward system is important uh, for the easy target for nicotine, the, including the BTA, the amygdala, the nucleus accumbens, and extension to the frontal cortex or hippocampus, and of course, the nicotine receptors. We're going to focus in on one structure, the nucleus accumbens, that Dr. Hood mentioned several times this morning. The behavior mechan mechanism of nicotine are mediated in our part in this area, a terminal region of the mesolimbic pathway where dopamine levels are increased following nicotine administration and decreased during withdrawal from this drug. Okay, the nucleus accumbens is an important uh, area for the motivation. Uh, as it has been in play, implicated in modulating the reinforced properties of drug of abuse, playing a role in the adverse aspect of drug withdrawal, as reported during, during diazepam or morphine, or even alcohol and amphetamines uh, withdrawal. This is important for, for us. Recent work in our, in our laboratory focusing in the, on developmental difference to nicotine withdrawal demonstrate that adolescents that exhibit lesser withdrawal associated deficit in nucleus accumbens dopamine. We're still talking about dopamine as compared to nicotine dependent adults. So this is consistent with previous studies. You can see here adolescents and adults that are exposed to nicotine during withdrawal. Adolescents, they, they present less uh, the decrement of, of dopamine is, is less severe, so they, uh, in other words, they don't feel so bad when dopamine decreases as compared as adults. Our initial studies focus in, in nucleus accumbens dopamine were a logic way to, to understand the mechanism of nicotine withdrawal, given the importance of dopamine in this area. However, the mechanism of nicotine withdrawal also appeared to involve cholinergic transmissions in the nucleus accumbens. The nicotine withdrawal produces increased acetylcholine levels in this brain region, in fact, in, all the, in the brain, but the consequence of increments of uh, acetylcholine in this area is particularly important. Given the potential role for cholinergic systems in mediating age difference to withdrawal, this study compared acetylcholine levels in the nucleus accumbens of adolescents and adult rats during precipitate withdrawal. 
the methods for our study. We have we divide, uh, divide our rats in three groups: adolescents, postnatal date 28 to 30, to reduce the control and nicotine treat; the adults, postnatal day 60 to 75, control and nicotine nicotine treat; and we add a group of pre-exposed rats. Rats in the postnatal day 95, this group of rats, they were pre-exposed to nicotine when they were adolescents. And, and during the, uh, this stage, they're receiving saline or nicotine. So we have nicotine saline, nicotine, nicotine. The study design is simple. We implant an osmotic pump to deliver nicotine. We implant a microdialysis probe, and then we assess uh, nucleus accumbens acetylcholine during withdrawal. Uh, in normal states, we don't know any rat that is smoking, so we had to, to try a different approach to deliver nicotine to the rat. So we use this pump. Uh, this is a small pump. We fill up the pump with nicotine, and then we implant the pump under the skin of the rat. We did change in temperature and humidity. The pump start delivering nicotine. Uh, for about uh, seven to uh, until 14 days. About seven days, we can see effects of the nicotine in, in the rat. They are already used to the nicotine. And that's for dependence. For withdrawal, we had two, two ways to, to produce the withdrawal. The spontaneous withdrawal is the removal of the nicotine pump. This is a more physiological way to, to produce withdrawal. It's like a, a person is smoking and they stop smoking, quit. And but the problem with the rat is is there are normal variations, so so we don't have the same time in all the rat to start measuring withdrawal. So it's better for us to induce precipitate withdrawal. That is the administration of the nicotine antagonist mecamilamine. We inject the rat and we produce withdrawal almost immediately. Following 13 days of nicotine exposure with the pump, nicotine pump, rats were implanted with a microdialysis probe in the nucleus accumbens. I'm sure you're familiar with this technique, but just in case you are not, uh, this is, a, let's see, a map of the brain, and it's showing a coronal cut here, section, you can see here, from the brain. This section is uh, uh, using Bregma, a part of the rat skull, like a reference, is 1.7 millimeters anterior to Bregma, and then we want to implant the pro in the nucleus accumbens, in specific in the shell of the nucleus accumbens, is this area here. So we move from the bregma to this side about 1.4 millimeters, and then we go down about 8 millimeters to in implant our probe. Once we have our, once we have our probe here, we start collecting samples. Our probe is a two-way cannula. We can perfuse a artificial cerebrospinal fluid through one side. And then at the, in the tip of the probe, we have the, this membrane is semi-permeable membrane. So the artificial cerebrospinal fluid can diffuse to the extracellular space and the liquid from the extracellular space can go into the probe and going up and we can collect samples uh, of, the, of the liquid in the brain. N next is uh, we quantify this mess, the, the samples using a SPLC system. This is a system that allowed to, to measure the levels of acetylcholine based on the electrochemical uh, properties of the, the neurotransmitter. Results. Uh, we found that baseline, baseline levels of acetylcholine are higher in adolescents. We, in fact, they're higher in all three groups, adolescents, adults, and pre-exposed rats. But you can see the increment in adolescence is, is very significant. It's almost twice the, the, the increment that the other two groups pre were presenting. So the average in the baseline of acetylcholine is high in all groups, especially in adolescence. Uh, if we want to check what happened with the levels of acetylcholine in the uh, other groups uh, and with different treatments, uh, we got to go to this graph. Uh, let's start with the adolescent and adults. So we have the saline, and then we have the rats uh, during withdrawal. The, the black areas is the, the rat with nicotine. This is the control saline. We apply mecamilamine to do different doses. 
and we produce withdraw. And we can see that the, that the levels of acetylcholine are higher in all three groups, uh, saline and mecamilamine in both adolescents and adults. Uh, the numbers are very similar. The increment here, sorry, the increment here is like uh, 40, 37%, and here we have a 41%, about 41%. So it's very, very, very similar, meaning that uh, the, this increment in acetylcholine is not really related to, to age. Adolescent and adults, they have the same levels of increment. But if we go to the third group, the pre-exposed rats, the rats that they were receiving acid, uh, nicotine when they were adolescents, and then again, uh, when they were adults, we can see how this response, the acetylcholine response increment that we saw in the two previous groups, is flat, is, is blunt, it does nothing happen here. So we can suggest that nicotine exposure during adolescence is producing not just short-term Chains, chains in the imme immediately. Also, it's producing long term chains uh, months ago. In the, this is in animals. In the case of in, uh, humans, it should be years uh, later. This, this is the same graph just to show you the increment uh, in between adolescent and adults. The increment from baseline is very similar, but in the pre exposed rats, it's almost, it's not changed. There is no change, even if it's a small decrease decrement in the levels of, uh, with com if we compare with controls. But in few words, there's no change here. So conclusions, age difference. Baseline levels of acetylcholine were higher in adolescents versus adult rats. We're higher in all groups, but more importantly, in adolescents when we compare with adult rats. During withdrawal, both groups display similar levels of acetylcholine. This suggests that the behavioral difference observed in nicotine exposed animals are not acetylcholine mediated. So we should back, go back again to the dopamine, uh, is the most important neurotransmitter there, but we know that it's not really, uh, related to acetylcholine. Pre exposure to nicotine effects. Baseline levels of acetylcholine were slightly increased by adolescent nicotine exposure, in almost nothing. So we can say that there's no difference in the in the adolescents when we compare the nicotine exposure with the saline rats. But during withdrawal, the increase in acetylcholine levels observed in naive adults were blown by adolescent nicotine exposure. This is consistent with other reports that they're talking uh, how they administer nicotine uh, to adolescents or even before during the neonatal stage or gestational exposure. Uh, and they produce the same. They, uh, it's a, they suppress the several functions, uh, dopamine levels, uh, norepinephrine levels. They, they, they have long-term effects. So th these results, we don't have the whole picture, uh, the exact meaning, but they are consistent with the idea that nicotine per exposure or nicotine during the adolescence is, is producing effects, not just during the adolescence. It's, they, it has some reminding effects uh, that is still we can see with adults. And that's it, this is the point we have right now. We're doing other studies, but so far is what we have. Um, before the, que the questions, I would like to thank the University of Texas El Paso, Dr. Sodell Lab is here, and James Orfila that he has an important participation in this study. And of course, financial support, for our VIDA program, uh, incenting funds from UTEP and funds from the National Institute of Drug Abuse. Now, yes, if you have some questions, oh, so abuse. Thank you, thank you, Louise. Excellent talk. Here, um, this is a rat. I'm not sure if he's smoking tobacco, but okay. It's a, <laughs> it's a, we can ask Dr. Hort. So, thank uh, you. Very, very, very interesting talk. Uh, I have a question about the the acetylcholine. Uh, when you measured acetylcholine, what was the rationale for it? You know, what do you think acetylcholine is doing in the nucleus accumbens in this regard? Uh, let me see if I could understand your question because it's a little distorted. But I can, can repeat. repeat I can repeat it. Thank you. Why did you measure acetylcholine? 
in the nucleus accumbens. What is the okay. function of acetylcholine in the nucleus uh, accumbens? Yes, uh, acetylcholine is not just in, in nicotine, but in other drugs, uh, morphine, opiates, in the nucleus accumbens, is like a marker, like a biomarker. Dopamine levels usually with drugs of use going high, uh, uh, the high, higher levels uh, in this area, and acetylcholine levels are going uh, down. So it's like a biomarker for withdrawal uh, or negative uh, if, effects if, of, of the drug. Uh, that's the reason we want to, to, to measure that because we're focusing in, the, in our lab, we're focusing with drug, with uh, pretty much. Uh, the idea is later, uh, most of the treatment, as I mentioned earlier, most of the treatment, the pharmacological treatment are focusing in, in, in withdrawal. They, they try the nicotine pa uh, patch. patch. Uh, yes, the, the, idea, <laughs> the idea is to increase the levels of nicotine, avoid uh, withdrawal. Uh, but we, we check in adolescents, uh, high levels of uh, dopamine is like, uh, they produce a higher pleasure than adults. So the, the, the nicotine, the transdermal nicotine, maybe is not the best solution. Also, the withdrawal is not so bad in adolescents, so we're not really uh, attacking anything. Yeah. So was the, that was the reason, is we're talking so, about, we want to, to study withdrawal. In, so in the let me system. offer you uh, an explanation for your data then. Uh, what, what your data indicates that acetylcholine actually is important also in satiety. So if animals, for example, in your, in your um, when, when the level of acetylcholine goes up, so that gives a, a kind of an indication that I don't want to use nicotine anymore. I'm good. But in your pre-exposed adolescents, which they are using nicotine over and over, and that's what you don't have that blunted signal you have. And because of that, they want to use nicotine again and again and again. So this could be an explanation for your data. That could be, yes, one explanation. Uh, again, it's a partial view. We don't have all the elements. That, uh, we don't know if nicotine in the brain of the adolescent or it is, is generating or making some kind of neurotoxicity that is uh, which effect we can see later. But yes, yes, I agree. That this could be one of the interpretations. Yes. Thank you.